Hello, I am here with my Quincy Institute colleague, Anatole Levin, a senior fellow at the Quincy Institute, as well as an accomplished author and journalist focused on Europe and Russian history and current military strategy and affairs. He has written extensively over the last year for our magazine, Responsible Statecraft, and a host of other publications about the growing tensions between the Washington DC establishment, NATO, Russia, all over Ukraine, and has repeatedly warned that without more ambitious and immediate diplomacy and more strategic empathy for Moscow's positions, we could be headed into a period of serious escalation, if not war in the region. Anatole, thanks for talking with us today. Um, let's start out with this. President Biden has warned that he believes that Russia is ready to invade. A lot of scholars, including yourself, have suggested that a Russian incursion into Ukraine could come soon without some sort of tangible negotiated agreement with Russia. You have said if a war does begin, it will most certainly begin in the Donbass region of Ukraine. Can you explain why, uh, what that war might look like, and why that region is such a flashpoint and of such importance for Russia? The Donbass is a coal mining region of eastern Ukraine, uh, which um, uh, attracted, uh, under Russian imperial and Soviet rule, uh, a great many Russian-speaking settlers. Uh, so it is um, the area of Ukraine, uh, apart from Crimea, where the greatest number of Russians are concentrated. And the people of the Donbass, or the great majority of them, have always been, for that reason, deeply unhappy uh, with moves by Kiev towards an ethnic version of Ukrainian identity and an attempt to Ukrainianize uh, the politics, the culture, education system of Ukraine. So when in 2014 uh, there was a revolution in Kiev uh, against uh, the president who had won an overwhelming majority of the votes in the Donbass and indeed in eastern and southern Ukraine more generally, uh, sections of the Donbass population essentially revolted and uh, declared themselves a separate, of course unrecognized, uh, republic. And uh, they organized their own militia, but they've received a great deal of military help and support from Russia. And Russia has warned that if there is an attempt by Kiev to reconquer the region by force, then Moscow will fight. Uh, this is by far the likeliest um, immediate spark or excuse for a wider Russian attack on Ukraine. And so uh, moving to solve the Donbass issue uh, would, uh, I think, contribute greatly to a solution of the crisis over Ukraine in general. And there's been fighting in the Donbass region all along since 2014. What uh, can you explain what the difference is between what was going on there right now and an anticipated incursion, like what that would look like? Well, President Biden, uh, in a rare moment of complete honesty by a leading statesman, uh, said today that there could be a great difference between a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine and a smaller incursion, which presumably would only be intended to defeat Ukrainian forces in the Donbass and maybe you know, take over the whole of that territory. Uh, so um, we don't really know. We do not know what Moscow is planning. Uh, but of course, what could happen is that they would uh, attack the uh, Ukraine in the Donbass, stop, and then wait to see what the West does. Uh, if the West indicated a uh, willingness to enter into real negotiations, then I think Russia wouldn't go any further. If, however, um, as obviously Washington desires, but much of Europe does not, um, uh, that the West introduced full-scale economic sanctions against Russia, then of course Russia would have nothing to lose and I think would launch uh, a much bigger offensive to occupy a much bigger part of Ukraine. Now, you have written most recently for Responsible Statecraft that you had convened a group of scholars, former ambassadors and officials for a closed-door meeting to talk about all of these issues, but mostly to talk about what steps need to be taken in this negotiated or negotiation process to avoid the conflict that we were just talking about. Can you go through some of the key steps that you believe need to be taken to avoid conflict? 
Yes, it's worth saying that the the members of this working group are, are you know, all uh, by definition experts on Russia and Ukraine, but are also considered, you know, very much on the calm, sensible, pragmatic, non-alarmist side. Well, the great majority of them thought that we are now indeed very close to war um, because uh, the Russian government has boxed itself in with its, you know, not in themselves very extreme, but considered by the West to be unacceptable demands. Uh, and meanwhile, um, the United States and even Europe have boxed themselves in by categorically rejecting these demands instead of using them as the basis for counter offers. So, um, and the, the general consensus is that we are now very close to war. We have a matter of weeks at most to avoid this. Uh, and um, the only basis on which we can open negotiations uh, with the Russians are, uh, firstly, either directly or indirectly, or at least temporarily, to freeze the process of Ukrainian accession to NATO, which, by the way, is not going to happen anyway, but it's what the Russians are most afraid of. Now, that can be done uh, as the Russians have demanded, but we have rejected by simply ruling it out permanently. It could be done by a treaty of neutrality, uh, for Ukraine, but you know, based on the treaty of, treaties of neutrality for Austria and Finland during the Cold War, it could be done not by a permanent ban, but a moratorium of ten or twenty years on NATO membership. And by the way, there is absolutely no chance whatsoever that Ukraine will get into NATO within ten or twenty years. So you know, we're not sacrificing anything by this. Uh, or um, there would be a possibility of trying to do this by the back door, which, by the way, is why the Ukrainian government has refused to implement uh, a peace settlement for the Donbass, um, which is really to pursue uh, the principles of the Minsk II agreement of 2015, endorsed by the United States, made between France, Germany, uh, Ukraine and Russia, uh, which establishes um, autonomy for the Donbass within Ukraine, but full autonomy and demilitarization under international guarantees. Now, the reason why Ukrainian governments and parliaments uh, have, after signing the Minsk II agreement, have in effect refused to implement it, uh, is precisely that they think that an autonomous Donbass within Ukraine would act as a block against Ukrainian moves towards membership of NATO. So if we could solve the Donbass conflict, I think that that would, or at least indicate our real willingness to do so, including by putting pressure on Ukraine, I think that that could be a way uh, of um, at least reducing the present crisis and opening uh, a genuine negotiating process with Russia. You have also written about neutrality and how you think that is a solution. Can you explain what that means, what it would look like in practical terms? Well, I hope what it would look like would be what Finland and Austria looked like during the Cold War, because it's rather extraordinary when people talk about Finlandization as if it was some sort of vision of hell. Uh, I visited both countries repeatedly during the Cold War, and that says something about my age. Uh, and of course, these were fully developed Western free market democracies. And Finland, by the way, was already uh, one of the happiest and most contented places in the world. Uh, my, the, the point is that neutrality did not hurt these countries. It did not stop them from developing, you know, as successful democracies and economies. And I think this has a wider lesson, which is, unfortunately, if you look at uh, some of the countries that have been admitted to the European Union and NATO, Poland, Hungary, Romania, Bulgaria, Despite being members of these organizations, these continue to suffer very, very grave problems, either about respect for liberal democracy uh, and the rule of law um, uh, and for cultural pluralism, uh, and or, of course, when it comes to standards of governance and anti-corruption. So the point is, being in NATO and the European Union guarantees very little. You either have the domestic capacity, the cultural and social capital to develop as a successful democracy and economy, or you don't. Uh, and being in NATO and the European Union is largely peripheral to that. So, you know, the Ukrainians have it or they don't have it. But I think 
one thing that can also be said is that just as Ukraine isn't going to get into NATO in the foreseeable future, you know, if, if you look both at the present condition of the European Union and the state of Ukraine, there, there is no chance whatsoever of Ukraine being invited to join the European Union in the foreseeable future either. So in one sense, and I say this to Russians as well, this whole argument about Russia uh, with Russia over Ukraine is in a sense about very little. So just getting back to um, neutrality for a second, it, it, it would seem, at, you know, from my perspective, that Russia might not like neutrality because they like to have their influence, particularly in that eastern region. And the Ukraine government today might not like neutrality because they want to get into NATO and they want to be part of that alliance. And they want the, the defense architecture that the West can uh, supply. So how would both sides come to an agreement for neutrality, and, and maybe this is a broader question about Minsk II uh, and why that, why you see Minsk II as uh, the solution uh, that is required here. Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, as far as the Ukrainians are concerned, or at least when one says Ukrainians, one should always talk of, you know, Ukrainian political elites and governments, because one has to remember that at least until 2014, um, a huge majority of Ukrainians were opposed to NATO membership. And regularly, you know, a majority of Ukrainians voted for parties which stood for good relations with Russia. Uh, and although that has, of course, shifted quite significantly since uh, 2014, opinion polls tend to suggest that still huge numbers of Ukrainians uh, within, you know, what is now controlled by Ukraine, leave alone Crimea and the Donbass, uh, continue to oppose NATO membership because they think it will simply lead Ukraine into further conflict, about which they're quite right, of course. So um, the Ukrainian elites um, would reject neutrality. Uh, but in the first place, they aren't going to get into NATO, as I said. Um, but in the second place, this isn't up to them. Um, you know, it is up to us whether we uh, ex you know, take in new members of NATO. And it is certainly up to us uh, whether we spend enormous uh, amounts of money and run colossal risks to defend other countries. <laughs> That's a decision for us, for our governments, the, the those of NATO at present, America first and foremost, but also Britain and France and the others. So that's the first thing. As far as Russia is concerned, I think the only answer to that is, let, let's try them and see. Uh, but my sense is that since Russia has felt itself to be very much on the defensive in recent years, uh, a, a, a treaty of neutrality would appeal to them. And certainly, given that they have phrased their entire position in terms of the threat of NATO membership for Ukraine, it would, I think, diplomatically and politically be almost impossible for them to reject this, this offer. If they did reject it, well, then we would have a very uh, serious indication of the extent of Russia's uh, ambitions, and we would need uh, you know, at the very least, look, we're not going to fight Russia, that's out of the question, uh, but to prepare a much, much stronger set of economic barriers, you know, against Russian influence. But we can only know that if we make a, a, a reasonable offer and see what their response is. You have often talked about how uh, the negotiating process should be between the US and Russia in secret or at least in isolation of these other players, whether it be Europe or even Ukraine. I think for outside listeners, they're thinking, why, why would we not allow Ukraine to be part of a negotiating process? That seems a little heavy handed uh, and imperialistic. Um, can you explain your reasoning behind that tactic? Look, first of all, Ukraine is asking us, and by us I mean, of course, first and foremost, the United States, to come to their defense, to admit them to our alliance, and to make colossal military commitments you know, to them, and run a colossal risk of war. Ukraine is the petitioner here. That automatically gives us uh, the leadership of NATO, which really makes means the United States, the right to try to negotiate uh, a solution uh, to all this, uh, which, as I say, does not really betray Ukraine, because Ukraine is not going to get into NATO anyway, and we're not going to defend Ukraine, but which serves our interests. And I would remind every appointed and elected official 
of the United States and Europe, um, that in the end they have sworn oaths to the constitutions of their countries and the sovereignty of their countries as embodied in the peoples of those countries. The people of the United States is the sovereign of the United States, not the people of Ukraine. Um, and that, that is their fundamental duty. Not if that um, you know, is contradicted by truly important ethical principles, but in, that case, in this case, it isn't. Uh, so that's the first thing. But a more practical point, of course, is simply that, as we have seen for the past seven years, you know, when it comes to the Ukrainian non-implementation of the Minsk II agreement on autonomy for the Donbass, if we include the Ukrainians, no agreement can possibly be reached. And that isn't necessarily because presidents of Ukraine don't want it. Uh, it's worth pointing out that the last two presidents of Ukraine, including the present one, were both elected on platforms absolutely clear plat electoral platforms of seeking peace with Russia and agreement with Russia, because that is very popular in the Ukrainian population. The problem is that they are so scared of their own nationalist extremists that once in power, uh, they feel themselves incapable of actually doing that. I have to say that's not totally unlike the United States, where, of course, the Biden administration would be much freer uh, to re you know to try to reach reasonable compromises with Russia if it wasn't constantly looking over its shoulder, you know, at the what the Republican opposition would try to do to it, uh, or of course some of its own senators in Congress. So no, uh, as far as Europe is is concerned, uh, look on foreign policy, and many issues of you know, economic policy as well. Europe is completely incapable of deciding on anything by its very nature. The European Union is so internally divided with such different agendas and political cultures that it simply cannot agree. Um, the only alternative to America negotiating is if France, frankly, has the will it, actually to follow the logic of President Macron's latest statement and itself negotiate with with Russia uh, uh, on a deal. Uh, now, this may seem paradoxical since France is only one member of uh, the European Union and NATO, but every member of the European Union and NATO has a veto over new members. So actually, France is in a tremendously important position there. But the negotiations have to be conducted by one government. That can be the United States. Ideally, it should be. Uh, or it could be France, but it most certainly cannot be Brussels, either in the form of NATO or the European Union. You bring up a good um, point here. It seems to me when I'm listening to the news, it, it I get the sense that NATO is speaking in one voice. Europe is speaking with one voice. They they want to resist Putin. They make Putin out to be the aggressor. They are marshalling their forces to defend Ukraine if there was an invasion, God forbid. But I'm getting a sense from you that all of Europe is not on the same page, that NATO doesn't speak for Europe. Where is Europe on this question or are they just divided? Well, of course, first of all, one should remember um, that uh, the continent of Europe does include Russia or European Russia and Belarus as well as Ukraine, and even a slice of Turkey. So Europe uh, is not simply the membership of NATO and the European Union. Um, and uh, incidentally, of course, if one talks about European security, uh, as Russia is just demonstrating and intending to demonstrate, you cannot have a serious European security architecture without Russia. What you have is a series of European crises. So that's the first thing. But the second thing is, um, Oh, sure, Europe looks very, very united and strong and heroic and courageous until it's asked to either pay or fight. Now, when it comes to fighting, there is no chance of that whatsoever. Um, NATO cannot fight. I mean, the only countries that actually have armed forces that would fight are far too weak in Europe. Uh, America has four brigades. Uh, Britain has two, at most two brigades that it could deploy. France has three. Um, that can't stop the Russians. As to the Germans, the Danes, the Italians, I mean, look, I'm sorry to be blunt, but don't make me laugh. I mean, they're not going to fight Russia. There's no chance of it whatsoever. Um, it's just never, never going to happen. Now, of course, uh, they are committed to 
fight to defend existing NATO members. But Russia has absolutely no intention of attacking existing NATO members. Why should it? It gets nothing from it. It runs extreme risks. So um, the, the the military strength of, of Europe is, is a, a cross between a, 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 a fantasy and a bad joke. Um, now, when it comes to uh, economic response to uh, Russian aggression, that is indeed very serious. Uh, as, as a threat. And by the way, the Russian government is well aware of this. But in this remarkable moment of candor, President Biden also drew attention to the key problem there, which is that if there is a full-scale Russian invasion of Ukraine, then I think that the pressure on the Europeans really to impose extremely severe sanctions on Russia will indeed be overwhelming and unavoidable. But if it's a much smaller clash in eastern Ukraine, you know, which only involves Russia taking over, say, the rest of the Donbass and, you know, basically making a point that it can win and the West won't fight, uh, then, uh, of course, there will be, I think, tremendous resistance in some European countries, above all Germany, to imposing really severe sanctions uh, for two reasons. One is that, as I say, at that point, I think Russia might well go much further. It would have nothing to lose. But secondly, and most importantly, of course, for them, uh, it would be the consequences uh, for German and European energy supplies. Germany is overwhelmingly dependent on Russian gas supplies. If they were interrupted, uh, you would see a massive economic crisis in Germany. You would see a measure of real public suffering. Uh, and you would see tremendous unpopularity of the existing coalition government only a few weeks into its time in office. So um, at that point, I think you would have a major dispute uh, would break out within NATO and the European Union, as President Biden has very honestly acknowledged. What about beyond sanctions? We have a group of bipartisan senators have just left to uh, travel to Kiev, I believe, uh, this week. Um, and they are talking about military aid. They're talking beyond sanctions. And we're and and these are both Republican and Democratic senators who believe, uh, in particular, Connecticut Senator Richard Blumenthal, who has said that we need to start sending military assistance and aid now before uh, an invasion even occurs. Can you talk a little bit about the consequences of those actions? Well, first of all, I, I should say that in, in the case of um, Mr. Blumenthal personally and his colleagues, I, I endorse their position altogether. And if they wish to enlist in the Ukrainian army, um, I will not merely uh, kiss them uh, goodbye enthusiastically at the airport. I will actually, and, and you know, I, I, I make this formal offer, I will buy them their equipment. Um, uh, as far as I'm aware of, though, um, not one in 10,000 at most uh, of the Westerners uh, who talk about defending Ukraine have the slightest intention of risking their own lives or those of their families in this heroic cause. Uh, so, um, you, you know, let, let us remember uh, that um, all of this indicates a desire to fight to the last Ukrainian, not the last American. Uh, but there are two great dangers here. The first is that given that Russia has protested so bitterly, this has been one of its main points, uh, about NATO arming countries on Russia's borders, uh, a major movement of US arms to Ukraine could very well be the trigger for a Russian invasion. Um, and it is highly unlikely that those arms could be deployed quickly enough uh, or the Ukrainians could be trained quickly enough to make any significant difference. But the second point is that the wildest elements in uh, Washington, including um, you know, former deputy secretaries of defense, my God, you know, have suggested sending uh, US advisors um, and special forces actually to train and even operate weapons given to the Ukrainians. Well, then you start to get into the scenario of Vietnam, South Vietnam before the Vietnam War. Because if you send uh, American soldiers into the front line operating weapon systems or standing behind the Ukrainians as they operate them, uh, then some of them are going to be killed, undoubtedly, in the event of war. Uh, 
And if that happens, you know, when the first American soldier dies in Ukraine, you move into a whole new level of crisis uh, and a much, much more dangerous one. And at that point, you have to come back to the question, you know, first and foremost, are we prepared to fight, to actually go to war with Russia for the sake of Ukraine? What possible American national interest, or British or French, is involved in this? And also, you know, how did Eastern Ukraine, a territory which I strongly suspect a large part of the US Senate, uh, you know, let alone the US public, could not find on a map, and was never of the slightest interest to the United States, historically speaking, how has this become the potential flashpoint for a disastrous American war? How? How did that happen? That's what we have to start by asking.